talk, and we're going to talk now about discovering spiritual gifts, and we're going to really, excuse me, God's pathways. We're going to basically be there the rest of the day. <coughs> so discover God's pathways for spiritual vitality. If you have the book or the journal or whatever, and you look in the index or the table of contents, you would see these kind of spelled out here. Uh, and how it works. And I'll, I'm going to put them up and then we'll explain how we go. And again, you can follow along in your outline. So these are what I call the five vital signs of spiritual health. Let me just tell you how I got here. So when I, I was taking a doctor ministry course at Fuller Seminary, and it was on spiritual formation and spirituality, and I was reading all these disciplines, and I read, you know, uh, Richard Foster, have any of you heard of Celebration of Discipline? And then later, Dallas Willard came out. He wasn't out yet, but I'm reading all these disciplines, and they're just overwhelming. Fasting, silence, solitude, prayer, you know, confession, worship, and they're all over the place. And Richard Foster, in his book, grouped them in terms of where they happen. He talked about the inward disciplines, the outward disciplines, and the community disciplines. And I thought, okay, that tells me where they happen, but why? And I would give the book to people to read, like my elders or people on my youth staff or whatever, and they'd kind of give it back saying, thank you. Yeah. That was interesting. It just didn't grab them like it had grabbed me. So as I was working on this, I had to prepare a course for the church I served on spiritual formation. And I just began to make a list. What, what are the disciplines? And I'll show you in a bit what they are. And then what result are they supposed to produce in my life? I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, and so I always ask, so what, and now what? I mean, that's what guides every sermon. So what? Well, here's what. And now what? Application. So I would list the discipline, and I'd say, what does this produce in our lives? And, you know, I'm a compulsive alliterator, so I said, well, this helps with God's presence. Well, the Bible brings you God's perspective. And, um, you know, this helps you with a sense of purpose and, and all that. And so I, I developed these, these traits, and uh, that's what I want to walk you through now. So I have a vital sign, like what, what does a spiritually healthy person look like? Have you ever tried to answer that question? What's a spiritually healthy person look like? Well, I'll give you my sense of it. It's incomplete, I'm sure, but it's, it's memorable. And again, Ollie and I were talking, and, and I said, you know, kind of my goal here is to just give you a reference point. The soul doesn't serve the disciplines. The disciplines serve the soul. If this works for you, great. If not, keep looking. The key is, are you spiritually vital, alive, healthy, in touch with the Lord? So the first vital sign is God's pace redeems our time. And under each of these vital signs, we will, I'll give you three disciplines, I'm selective, that will help you experience God's pace. <clears throat> and we're gonna look at those today. But so, um, the key here to pace is understanding that unless God's pace redeems our time, we will be lost in useless activity, you know, or we will be lost in the, you know, the wrong activity, or we'll just be overwhelmed and, and drained. And we have to redeem time. Uh, it will not automatically, you know, fall into place for us. God has to, we have to make active choices about our time. Boundaries. Sabbath keeping, which is really, really tough. The Sabbath is the only sin for which you will be, breaking the Sabbath is the only commandment for which you will be rewarded by your, <clears throat> by your organization. They love it when you overwork, right? I'm being a little facetious here. But when my wife said, they said, what's Doug's greatest weakness? A, a search committee asked that. And she said, workaholic. And their eyes lit up. They were so excited. So anyway, but God's pace. Do you think Jesus was all, like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to get it all done today. No. Did he ever rush? You know? Or was he like, well, that was a waste of day. I don't think so. 
I love him that shows, have, you, have any of you seen The Chosen? There's one where he's preparing the Sermon on the Mount, and it is just a crack up. Like he's trying out different phrases, and I'm thinking, no, I'm not buying that. Either. What do you think I should say, bless him? Poor, bless him. <laughs> That was weird. But anyway, I don't think the Lord wants us to feel rushed, pressured. There are times of demand. Absolutely. There are times of crisis. And we have to step up. No doubt about it. But the ordinary life, the day-to-day -day life, shouldn't be frenzied, I don't think. The second one is God's presence fills our hearts. And I start with pace because... If you don't take the time, the change won't happen. If you don't learn how to manage your pace, that's one of the first things I do in coaching. With people I say, you know how they say, if you want to know what a person's really like, look at their checkbook. I say, look at their calendar. You'll see what drives them. And you'll see if it's fear-based. Like, I gotta make everybody happy. I gotta get all this done. I gotta look good. Or, you know. So I start with pace because I think that is the framework of success. Then God's presence fills our hearts. How do you experience God's presence through the day? We talked about that a little bit earlier. You know, I kept saying, well, how do you remind yourself of that, Todd, in the middle of the day when you're feeling all this pressure? How do you remind yourself of the, that 10th step we were talking about? How do we remind ourselves? So how does God's presence fill our hearts? The third one is God's perspective renews our minds. And you're going to start now in chapter 12, I guess you're beginning. Um, you'll start the disciplines of perspective. So we're not going to talk about these three today, the next three. Um, but this is the renewing of our minds. And in that, I talk about two types of meditation. And, and this is where, in the November retreat, I would like to lead you through a contemplative meditation, which most people haven't experienced. It's using the imagination to enter into the scene. And it's... Really fun. But I talk about discursive meditation, excuse me, um, cognitive meditation, which is the normal study. But how do you bring your study to life as you look at scripture and then contemplative? And then also spiritual reading or spiritual input comes in here. Then God's power strengthens our will. When I talk about fasting, silence, and solitude, I'm talking about power. And that's kind of unique. I haven't read this in a lot of other spiritual disciplines, but these are the disciplines that help us detach from the world's power sources so that we can attach to God. And, you know, fasting, silence, solitude, they each represent a power source. Obviously food, but all the things we enjoy and that nourish our lives normally. Silence is the discipline of listening to God and not to all the other voices around us and all the other noise around us. And then solitude, who tells you who you are? What mirror are you looking into for your sense of identity and power? Jesus went into the wilderness in Luke chapter 4, and he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. He was in silence, solitude, and fasting when he experienced the temptations. So that's why I frame those in terms of power. And then the last one is God's purpose directs our steps. The disciplines, as you can already see, are not an end in and of themselves, but there are disciplines of purpose, which I call character, community, and call. <clears throat> and the call is your daily call as a follower of Jesus and your vocation. So that's just an overview of the disciplines, and we're going to, you know, begin to unpack them now. So now, this whole first part, I don't know if you remember I said at the beginning, we've talked about the process. The first, <coughs> the first five chapters of soul shaping, and you've gotten stuff, by the way, that was not included in the first five chapters, the matrix of vitality and stuff. But the first five chapters are really about the process. How do you move from soul neglect to spiritual vitality? How does change happen? One thing I skipped were the five inadequate strategies for change. Inspiration. You know, I, I call them inspiration, perspiration, hesitation, expectation. You can look at them if you want in there. But, and then we talked about the adequate strategy for change. Now we're moving to the practices. So we're going from the process, okay, I think I get it now, to the practices themselves. So do you have any question or comment at this point? Making sense? Keep your neighbor awake. 
Alright. Chicken's just about to hit. <laughs> Alright. So we're going to talk about pace. God's pace redeems our time. And I'm going to talk about the discipline of, re uh, of redeeming time. And if you have your book, I'll be kind of going over the guidelines that are in the Soul Shaping book on page 71. By the way, um, Praise has some extra books. And then I brought books and journals if you want to buy them. I don't know how they want to work it here. Um, but you can get those at the end if you want. <clears throat> so we'll take care of you if you want. So let's look at, at uh, redeeming the time. And that phrase obviously comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Redeem the time for the days are what? <laughs> My Bible says evil. Right? Now you got me all messed up here. Redeem the time for the days are evil. Do, do your Bibles really say short? You're just making it up. Okay. All right. Take note, Major. Your people make things up. Um, I'm going to give the whole passage here because I, I can see we need it. <laughs> Okay, Ephesians, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Oh, here we are. Okay. So Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The Hebrew is uh, redeeming the time uh, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Debauchery. What a great word. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to another, one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and brass instruments. And make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks. So be very careful how you live, making the most of the time. Because the days are evil. That is, ex agorazo is the Greek word for to redeem the time. Agora, if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been to Athens or whatever, I mean Greece. The Agora is the marketplace. And X means to buy out. So buy out of the marketplace. And it's that image of redemption which means we buy out of slavery. You know, redemption means you've been bought back. You've been bought with a price. And that's what we have to do with our time. Notice the image here. Basically, Time has enslaved you, and you need to break the power of time enslaving you. Does that sound too <clears throat> crazy? We are slaves of time. And so the Lord says you can redeem the time by experiencing the reality of the gospel setting you free to, to redeem the time. So how do you do that? Well, again, there are systems for this, <laughs> and that's, what the, that's where the journal comes in, the Soul Shaping Journal comes in. But I learned a lot of this from um, Stephen Covey, and I give him credit. Have any of you read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Have you seen that? Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a good resource. But what, uh, the, the thing we talk about here in, in that is the, what they call the quadrants. So this is uh, important. Wait, this is urgent up here and non-urgent. And then important. I'm gonna, it's hard to, to write down. Here. Important and not important. So this is a, just a very basic, you know, kind of like a matrix here. Here we go again, right? But you have the, the, the quad one, the urgent, important thing. You know, people are calling, you have things to do. We all have that stuff. But the, ur the important but not urgent things, what are some examples of something that is really important, but it's not urgent? Exercise. Exercise? Sure. I mean, nobody's going to, you know, beat you up or whatever if you don't exercise. Sleep. What's another? Sleep. Sleep. Sleep, okay. 
So self-care. Some others that are important but not urgent. How about planning? All, all of you love to plan, right? You have to work on your work as well as working in your work. So you have to step back and say, am I doing the right stuff? Being strategic. All right, so there's a lot of things here. So we have a lot of urgent things every day. You know, you may have stuff you just have to do, and that's understandable. The point is, if you are living over here, if you ignore these things, they'll probably end up over here. And suddenly your life becomes more and more urgent. We talked about procrastination, fear, and all those things. What you want to do is you want to shrink the urgent in your life so that you have more of the non-urgent important things you're doing. Soul care would be one of these. If you take care of your soul, you're likely to do better and to do things well. Um, urgent but not important, I mean, you know, and, and over here is, is crazy. They call this the quadrant of waste. This is the quadrant of quality. Um, this is the quadrant of waste, and I wanted to look at, um, i got to look at my notes here for this. The quadrant of deception. Ooh. Doesn't that just send chills down your spine? This is where, this is often other people's agenda for you. There you go. You've got to do this. You've got to help me here. I mean, I need you. you and, and you've got to say, well, does that really fit my call? The, you know, where I am in my life right now and all that. So this is the quadrant of deception, the quadrant of waste, and the quadrant of quality. So one of the things to do, and again, exercises for you, is to say, what are the things I have to do and what are the things that would be really smart for me to do? And how do I pri book my priorities? There's a phrase everybody says, schedule your priorities. No, I mean, excuse me, prioritize your schedule. No, schedule your priorities. Because there, you may have a to-do list and all, and all the to-do list things are down here in the quadrant of deception or waste. And you've never taken time to examine the to-do list and so you want to examine that and then schedule the not urgent important things in, in. Like when are you at your best for your soul time? I forget who was saying it at night, I forget who said that. But early morning is best for most people. One of my friends read Soul Shaving and said, I'm gonna have to take five hours every morning just to get all the things done that you think we should do. And he overstated just a little bit. Um, but when are you best for scheduling things in? And maybe there's certain things you do once a week. You have a more extended quiet time on your day off or whatever, uh, before you watch Netflix and everything else. Um, but maybe you have a more extended time or once a quarter or once a month, you begin to schedule them in, but drop those in. It's like vacations. I don't know how you guys do scheduling, but I had to drop my vacations in a, a year in advance so that my staff team could schedule their lives around my vacations and what I was doing. It was just the way it worked. And I had to do a lot of advanced planning. So that's, that's part of redeeming your time is prepare your heart. Lord, I want to redeem my time today. Pray. And then list your priorities, your projects, your appointment. And then schedule the priorities and let the rest of the schedule flow around it. And I think there's absolutely something to this whole time thing. You know, they say time expands to, work expands to fill the time allotted. I think work shrinks to fill the time allotted. I, I encourage you to test that. You're all in different places, so it would take more of a personal conversation to figure that out. But I find sometimes I over-prepare. I don't mean to do all that work. I'm ready. Uh, Henry Now, did any of you know the name Henry Now? A lot of writing and spirituality. He was taking a retreat, I think at a Trappist monastery in Kentucky, 
but it may have been the, the Genesee one in New York. But he was on retreat, and four high school boys showed up. They'd heard he was there, and they'd read his stuff. The four high school boys. And they said, we would like you to lead us in a retreat this weekend. And this came, a message came to Henry, and Henry sent back a message. I've got to check with my retreat master before I do that. And he sat down with the retreat master, and the retreat master said, what do you want to do? He said, I don't want to do it. I just want to be on retreat with, with you. Well, Henry was going to be there like a month. The retreat master said, you're doing the retreat. And Henry said, I'm not prepared. He said, Henry, you're more prepared than 10,000 people in the world. All you have to do is show up and be with these boys. And it, it, it's kind of a fascinating story about over preparation and over anxiety. And it was like when Jesus said to the disciples, you feed them. Lord, where are we going to get the food? Have them sit down, bring me what you have, I'll take care of it. So I have often said, Lord, redeem the time. Especially after interruptions. You've got to be ready for God to interrupt your schedule. And, right, that most of Jesus' ministry happened in the interruptions, by the way. But Lord, here's my schedule, and it's yours now. Interrupt it, do what you want with it, but I trust you, Lord, to redeem the time. So try that process of, that's the, that's the big global one of redeeming the time. Then I have two other disciplines we're going to talk about. Enjoy Sabbath rest next. But I also have another discipline called Celebrate Sacred Milestones. And what I did was basically think of the, the pacing of Israel's life. They had a weekly rhythm. They had a daily rhythm. <clears throat> you know, a morning and, after, and evening sacrifice. They had a weekly rhythm of six days of work, one day of Sabbath. And then they had an annual rhythm of festivals. So I kind of framed the, uh, the passage around that. So let's look at the, the um, next one is enjoy Sabbath rest. And again, if you wanna follow through on the, on, in the book, it's on page 82. But I wanna talk about Sabbath for a minute. How many of you, you don't have to answer this, how many of you feel like you know how to take a Sabbath rest? A couple of you do. Well, let me ask you, Andre, how do you, how do you do it? What's it like for you? First of all, no to-do list. No what? No to-do list. Okay, all right. Uh, and I try to focus on activities that are energy-giving. Mm -hmm. And I can enjoy. And not only family focus. Uh, and my, my goal is to have that weekly and also reflection. Have that reflection. Mm -hmm. of what happens, not necessarily looking what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So kind of meditate what happened, or as we be grateful for those things and kind of saturate that bit of gratefulness. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an ongoing, still perfect, but I'm trying to, to do it that way. What day, what is the... I've been doing Monday. Monday, okay. Because you work Sunday. Yes. All right. And uh, when did this be, start to become a practice in your life? Well, last year I led a series of Best Ranch on Saturday. Okay. And as I was discovering, and it was always a topic that I tried to put off because it sounded too theologically uh, religious to me before. Uh, but then I started like, understanding uh, from a book that I read, uh, The Garden by John Mark Comer. Oh, wow. I started getting interested about figuring out what is actually living a life based on the kingdom peace life. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what started initiating this inquiry in how to really live life uh, that is based in God's kingdom. Since we already entered that kingdom, how to live life in that kingdom. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how it started. Great. That's great. Um, Shannon, you, did you want any insights on Sabbath for you?
And when did you start that practice? The series with Lydia, mm -hmm. and we really talked about it. I was much more intentional, so I have to carry that. Yeah. Good, thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering about practice more during my visit to Israel. Oh. Uh, last November, where I learned it's a day where everything is closer around you. It's mm -hmm. time for our family. It's meeting their phone, meeting on iPad. It's prayer time. It's reflection about. The family, what they've done in the week. Mm -hmm. um, and that was so beautiful to see that. I wasn't used to that. Mm -hmm. um, usually it's take one day out and have a whole mess of things right. done far mm -hmm. From that day, I started learning after we did it. It's time just, just time to let everything um, around me just go. Just, just relax mm -hmm. and be, you know, enjoy myself. <laughs> So I know how to pray for you now. Yeah. yeah, you do not want to get on the Shabbat elevator in Israel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have to go up right? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, you can't create a spark on the Sabbath, so pushing a button makes a spark. So it's automatic, but it parks at every floor for five minutes. So if you're on the 20th floor, don't get on Shabbat elevator. We'll learn that part. Yeah, yeah, right. Good. Well, this is great. What is the biggest resistance for you, if you have it, to taking a Sabbath? Or what, what are some of the reasons you don't have the kind of Sabbath, and maybe you all do? I'm going to assume some of you don't. I think that's probably the biggest, but... Mm -hmm. 
one of the goals I think is for the organization you know this is that long-term goal how do you create the environment around you that cultivates a godly pace doing a sustainable ministry at a godly pace one of the things that made it difficult for me to take a Sabbath was I had so many desires to accomplish things I wanted to write this book I wanted to lead that seminar I wanted to do this I wanted to do that I wrote my sermons on my day off because I had to make everybody else happy all the time, and then, then I'll write my sermon or whatever. So there's all these resistant points to the Sabbath that I think we need to become aware of and to really humble ourselves and say, God doesn't need me. The Lord doesn't need me. And the Lord wants to use me, but he wants to use a healthy me. And if you look at the Sabbath in Scripture, it's absolutely fascinating. There are two reasons given for the Sabbath, or two rationale. Um, given for the Sabbath, one in the book of Exodus and one in the book of Deuteronomy. And it's absolutely fa fascinating. <clears throat> um, I don't have that right in my, in my uh, notes here. So let me just look at the Exodus one and read it to us quickly. Exodus chapter 20. Where the Lord gives the rationale for the Sabbath. You shall keep the Sabbath because. So we look at Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days shall you labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work or, or anybody else in your house. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And on the seventh day he rested. <clears throat> so the first rationale for the Sabbath is, this is the design of creation. This is how you're wired. This is how I do it. This is the pattern for living. I made the earth in six days. We don't know how that may be interpreted in all these ways. But this is the image, and then you rest one day. And then in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, you can remember the Ten Commandments, 10 times 2 is Exodus 20, 10 and a half is Deuteronomy 5. The rationale is for, I delivered you from Egypt. So it's creation and redemption. I made you, and I bought you. And therefore, you will keep the Sabbath. And the, the fundamental reason of the Sabbath is honoring God. Why would they stone a guy for collecting firewood on the Sabbath? You ever think about that? I mean, that's very unnerving. This guy's collecting firewood, and they stone him. It's because he dishonored God. It's God's day. And why is it God's day? Because he wants you to rest. Why do we fight rest? It's, it's amazing. It's a real paradox, uh, which I've struggled with. And, you know, I'm coming to some resolution now. But the Sabbath is given for man, Jesus said, humanity, not humanity for the Sabbath. Again, that's the Pharisee flip. The Pharisees always flip that. They say, you know, we've got to keep God's laws to make God happy. God said, no, I made these laws so that you would be fulfilled. Husbands, don't mess around with another woman. Wives, don't mess around with another man. It's so you'll be miserable? No, that's the way to happiness. Don't steal, you know, don't bear false witness. These are the keys to happiness. So that's why God gave us these. And so the root is in God's honor. In fact, in Numbers 15, the defiant Sabbath breaker was put to death because of a high-handed sin. In other words, that's self-acknowledged, that's, you know, uh, intentionally committed sin. It wasn't just accidental. Uh, I think Shannon mentioned it, that she has a day off and then a Sabbath. Not everybody can do that, but it is really a good distinction to make. That hopefully you have a day off or you figure out time off when you do your chores and then make the Sabbath just a gift to yourself. When I was in high school, I learned about the Sabbath from R.C. Sproul. And so I made a great covenant with the Lord. I don't tell many people about this. But I made a great covenant with the Lord that I would never study on Sunday. <laughs> I told my mom, sorry, it's the Sabbath. Um, but I would read because I love to read, but I would never study. And I carried that all the way through seminary. And my grades were fine. I did, I did fine. And the Sabbath became an oasis. I could just do what I wanted. It was like a snow day. Do any of you know what a snow day is? Yeah. All right. Some of you have lived in snowy country, Pittsburgh. Yep. That's a hell of a city, right? That is one hell of a city. Um, but a 
snow day is like all of a sudden everything's canceled and you can do what you want. That's what the Sabbath is meant to be. So I talk about several, um, the, one of the things that helped me most was to schedule a 24 hour period beginning at sundown. You know, that's how the Hebrew keeps track of time. The Hebrew starts with rest, sundown, and then the work day comes. That's a Hebrew concept, work from your rest. So start at sundown and go 24 hours. For me, now, now I'm retired, it's a little bit different. So I, I, I go to church on Sunday, I don't have to work on Sunday. Um, so, but when I was active in ministry, I would begin Thursday night and go through Friday night. And by beginning at sundown, I had kind of the day to prepare for it. You know, we didn't, you know, we still cook and do stuff. And I cook in our house too. We still did stuff, but then sundown, it was free. And then went through the rest of the day and at sundown, you could catch up. It was kind of interesting. And then that list of Sabbath activities, you listed a bunch of good ones. Read a book, take a walk, spend time with family, time in preparation, gratitude, worship with God's people. But make a list of activities so that when you get this free time, this snow day, this Sabbath, you're like, what do I do? I don't know what to do with this time. I've always done, what do I do with it? Make a list of things that renew you. Um, make worship a priority and then be flexible. But I love Abraham Heschel's statement. There's a number of statements that are around this theme which say, for six days the world has your soul. On the seventh day you remind yourself it belongs to God. And the Sabbath is meant to reorient us. Abraham Heschel, Jewish theologian, the most quoted theologian on the Sabbath that I can read, said in the Sabbath you build a cathedral in time. You build a cathedral in time. What's most valuable to people in our culture especially? It's their time. Hey, can we get together? Yeah, I have, I have time about six weeks from now. Well, it's crazy. I now have a little Calendly link. Do any of you have Calendly links? So people can see when you have an opening on your schedule. Yeah, it's a bookie. Oh, crazy. All right. So in terms of Sabbath, I would encourage you to obey the Lord. I wasn't kidding when I said it's the only commandment you can break and not get fired and in fact be promoted. And so how do we change the culture? Let me just stop and brainstorm with you for a minute because I'd love to hear your thoughts. What are some ways that you could affect the Salvation Army culture in terms of respecting Sabbath and encouraging Sabbath among the people? I don't know about your day-to-day -day culture, so this will be interesting to me. But what, oh, yes. Yes, don't call major on Friday. Okay. <laughs> All right. And therefore, they, they need to communicate to you their Sabbath day. Yes, I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah. I think uh, for most supervisors or managers on the weekly check-in, uh -huh. to actually integrate that in their check-in and say, hey, what did you do in your Sabbath? And encourage your man to, to rest on a positive rest. It's so like actively on a weekly basis. How would you introduce that to them so that they feel like this is not a, uh-oh, but more of a like, hey, this is, a, this is a gift we want to give you? I think it's more like life pace. You can talk on the format of life pace and also uh -huh. work in life pace. So mm -hmm. those are yep. concepts in terms of uh, you know, the workplace, they're common, and we can talk from the weekly basis. How, how are you uh, maintaining you know, uh, yourself in this area? Yeah, yeah. And I think for leaders, it's great to be able to model that themselves. Yeah. Their, their team. So model it yourself. Do, do it in the check-in. Respect each other's boundaries in terms of your calls.
Mm -hmm. we're, we're pouring into our friends and staff constantly. Just taking these and teaching them we're going to block out this two hours once a month okay. to do this. Um, so kind of on a much smaller scale. Yeah, but that's that's also more about about pace also. Like, well, how do I remind myself that this this job doesn't own me and want to wring everything out of me and all? In terms of burnout, you know. Burnout is such a reality. I went out with a pastor recently at the church we're starting to go to, and it's a large moving church and all that. And, and uh, he kind of shared a story, and then he said, can I ask you a question? Sure. How do you prevent burnout? That was the number one top question on his mind. We had a no agenda lunch. I had no agenda for him. I just want to get to know him and stuff. And he said, how do you prevent burnout? And that, I've seen so many people go down. I, and I, I've been singed by burnout myself. So I know what that's like. So enjoy Sabbath rest. Okay, let's look at, um, so these are meant to be things that help with our pace. And again, if you sit back and look, it takes time to figure out how to live by a different pace. And that's where most people resist. Because you gotta take time to work on your work as well as in your work. You have to take time to work on your life as well as living. How would you say that to someone that you're trying to mentor, what I just said? How would you say that in your own words? It's the chips that kicked in. <laughs> What is it? <laughs> yes, David? I moved over to that table. I thought you were being throwing this, man. You look good. You look good. We, we paid her to say that. How would you explain to someone like you're supervising that it's okay to take time to work on your work, to step back and work on your work? How would you explain why that's important? What's the, what's, what did you call this time? Balcony space from Ron, uh, Ron Heifetz. I don't, he, I don't know if you're using it from him, but he always talks about getting up on the balcony. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I think lead through reflective questions mm -hmm. more than just uh, telling. Yeah. Get a person in that journey of understanding and comparing. I always like feeling now that we've done this activity. And compared to when you're not resting, and mm -hmm. working, yeah. let them through that reflection. Because otherwise, I think we're all sick of people preaching at us. Yeah. But how are we reflecting? How Present we company excluded. <coughs> no, no. I mean, we are learning with you on yeah, right. this journey. But I'm saying, like, I think sometimes you have the tendency to always tell yeah. what people need to do rather than get them to reflect. Yeah. Did your hand go? No. no. But I think just, you know, encouraging um, people that we work with to take their breaks, to take, you know, rest on their breaks, and, uh, uh -huh. you know, like, yeah. to take care of ourselves, because it, it's tempting just to work, 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 work. Yep. But we work better when we're taking good we care of ourselves. Right. And sometimes it's hard, that tyranny is divergent. Mm -hmm. It's really pressing sometimes. But yeah. So I think also modeling that and encouraging our staff to, you know, mm -hmm. take care of ourselves and take care of each other. Yeah. That's how I think we can change the culture, right? It's easier said than done. It is, <laughs> but it's so necessary. You know, there's a lot of people who need permission. Yeah. And they need permission from a supervisor to say, you know, it's okay. And whatever your boundaries are, I don't know what your boundaries are, but it's okay to leave at five. If you have too much to do, there's tomorrow. Yeah. And by the way, what makes this too much to do? So I can understand if, if, if we're matching your capacity with our needs and in a non-threatening way, but helping people to, to reflect, like you say, more of a coaching approach to supervision. Like, well, how does it make you feel when you're overextended? What would be helpful to you to not feel so overextended? You know, just more of a coaching approach to things. So. 
Good. Well, the goal, again, the goal of this would be, and it's not just soul shaping, but the goal is to develop a culture of spiritual vitality where the people are moving into their work and life out of the energy of the Holy Spirit, out of the sense of God's presence with a gospel motivation and a compassion and care, you know, all of those things. And you, I think a lot of you are gatekeepers to that. You're the permission givers, you're the pace setters, you're the models. Again, I, I don't know your role, so I don't know what I'm, I'm not referring to anybody in particular, but everything you can do, you can help shape a culture and remind everybody, because that's the amazing thing about this, is they set up some retreats and some resources and a weekly resource to say, this matters. That's huge. There's a lot of churches that don't take the kind of time you're taking uh, for their soul care. Okay, so let's look at the next one, and this is where we'll um, go today, is God's presence. And my favorite <laughs> discipline is preview. And it's a discipline I stumbled into, and I kind of tell the story in the book, but I'm gonna tell it again, because I love this. I've never heard of this discipline before. I've heard of examine, which I call review and all. But I had a men's Bible study. I always had a men's Bible study ever since I became a pastor. So there was always a group of men I was with in every church I served. So I came right out of seminary into Old Greenwich, Connecticut, which is just a couple of small towns up into Connecticut from Greenwich and before Stanford, if you know the East Coast. So they all commuted into New York City. So I had Jim and Glenn and George and uh, Walter in my group, and we would meet at six and be done by seven because they could walk up to the train and be in the Midtown. If you live in New Jersey, if, if you work in Wall Street, you live in New Jersey, usually Midtown, you live in Connecticut, the way the trains run. <clears throat> and so one time, one of the guys said before we closed, hey Doug, can you come in the Midtown at least once a month and we'll do the Bible study in, the mid in Midtown? Uh, I've already talked to St. Bart's, St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church at Park and 50th. We can get a room there for free. I can cater in a lunch and we can have our Bible study at noon. And I thought, I don't want to go to New York City. <laughs> My guys are doing it every day. Uh, but I said, well, sure, but why? And when he said why, it stopped me in my tracks. He said, because by the time I leave here, I, I read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and then I'm working on my to-do list. I've forgotten all about our Bible study. But if I think if I got on the train and saw you on my calendar, I'd think about the Lord in our Bible study all morning, and then I'd probably think about it all afternoon because you're right in the middle of my day. And I don't know what, I think it was the Holy Spirit, but suddenly the thought on your calendar hit me. And I said to the guys, yeah, let's talk about that next week and we'll set that up. But take out your calendars. Do any of you remember paper calendars like a day timer or a cubby plan? Do you remember those? This is my kind of group. Um, yeah. But um, so I had them take out their calendar and I said, you know, get a pen or a pencil, whatever you use. I always use pencil on a calendar, man. Pen, ooh. I said, pray over your schedule today and your to-do list. Go through it hour by hour. And, you know, put a cross next to everything once you prayed for it. And listen to the Lord. The Lord may say something to you. And if he does, write it down. So the guys prayed through their day. And they seemed, you know, really happy. I prayed through mine. Felt good to kind of give all that to the Lord. And then they went off to mid, uh, Midtown and came back. And one of the guys, I call him different names in the book. George is his name. Um... George called me at night. George never called. He said, hey, you got a minute? I said, well, yeah, for you? Absolutely. And he said, I got to tell you what happened today. He said, when we were going through our schedules, the biggest thing that I couldn't let go of was I've got to fire someone. And the problem is I recruited him. And he told me briefly he recruited this guy about two or three months ago, brought him away from a very secure, prosperous job, you know, secure job over to his job to kind of take something new and risky but the reward would be worth it and and all that and and george said it's just not working 
And I could, I could barely get by it, Lord. What am I going to do with this guy? And the Lord said, 1030. That's all the Lord told me, 1030. So I had an open morning. I had plenty to do, but open schedule. I wrote down 1030 and I put his name. So we go into, you know, get in, the, get off the subway. I go to the lobby of my, you know, my office, and I'm getting on the elevator, and I notice it's empty, which is crazy at, at you know, rush hour. And as I'm going to get on, I hear, "Hold the door," and it's the guy. Oh, well, I got a fire. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but he gets on the elevator with me, and we're alone, and the door's closed, and we're going up to the floor, and the guy says, "Hey, can I meet with you this morning? Something's kind of on my mind." And George goes, yeah, I think that'll be fine. The guy said, how about 10.30? <laughs> George goes, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, the, you know, George is just beside himself right at this point. So he's praying all morning for this appointment. And the guy comes at 10.30, or, yeah, 10.30. And when he comes in, he closes the door. Well, as an executive, you always know that's a sign. They're closing the door. And the guy sits down, and it's obvious the guy's nervous. And he says, George, it's not working for me here. And there's more I want to tell you about that. But before, before I do, I got to tell you a story. He said, I was praying this morning. I've been, I've been all upset about how things are going here. I feel like I've let you down. It just doesn't feel good. I've been praying about this for uh, weeks. And I was praying this morning and the Lord said 1030. <laughs> and I said, no, Lord, I am not ready. And Lord, if you want me to do this, I need a sign from you. I'm sorry, I'm going to pull a Gideon fleece. If I get on the elevator alone with George, then I'll know today's the day. So George, I was with you on the elevator, and you said you were free today, so I guess I'm supposed to go ahead with this. So here's the deal. I know it's not working, and I, I'm willing to leave. But if you fire me today, I'll be toast. And, you know, you got to have a job to find a job and all that stuff. And he just said, George, I need some time, probably two to six weeks or whatever. I've actually been making some inquiries. I'm just asking you, I would give you my letter of resignation today so long as I don't have to date it. Because I guarantee you I'll be gone within two months. Well, what do you think? And George says, well, I'm sad to say it's not working for you here. And I agree with you that I think you'll be better also. And I need to ask your forgiveness because I recruited you here and I thought it would be a great match. So I'm sorry for that. So yeah, we'll go ahead with your plan. But before we talk about any details, can I tell you a story? And George talked about praying 1030. Is that cool? Is that cool or what? That's the most dramatic story I have. But I think that's the one that got me launched. And so... The, the idea is you, you give your day to the Lord and then, and then you turn it over to Him and you preview the day. It's holy anticipation. Holy anticipation. And then you're going through the day thinking, you know what? I listened to the Lord. I have this meeting today. How are you going to work on that meeting, Lord? And He'll give you ideas or whatever. I've used preview with a phone call. Again, that story's in the book. But I had a woman who was complaining about one of my staff members, and she was vicious. And, and he let her down, but she was really out to get him. And I put off calling her, put off calling I'd pray, and I'd sing like, I, just don't, I can't do it today. I can't call her. Finally, one day, I prayed, and the Lord said, call her today. I called her. This does not happen all the time, by the way, but hey, you got to tell the good stories. And, and so I called her, and she said, I can't believe you're calling today. I said, why? What's up? I approached it as a pastoral call instead of a supervisor call. I said, what's up? She said, well, my ex-husband's getting married today, and um, it's the worst day of my life. All my kids are there. I feel so alone. I feel so cut off. I just, and she's crying, you know, and I'm thinking, how are we going to come? <laughs> okay, Lord, you obviously had this. So I listened to her, and we kind of prayed. We did pray, and I said, well, you know, I didn't know this was happening today. I was following up on your concern. And she goes, Doug, it's not a concern anymore. I need to talk to him directly. And I realize all the emotions I've been, you know, feeling, I've, I've just kind of dumped on him. Let me just call him and, and talk to him. And then if I need to bring you in, I will. Click. Problem solved, you know. And it was a pastoral ministry. 
So often as I go into meetings, I, I use the prayer that I use there, Lord, give us what you want to give us in this time. I pray that before meetings. I pray that before individual meetings, before group meetings. And that's always kind of a preview prayer and going into it. So I just encourage you to realize that the Lord, think of it, if, if you were God, wouldn't you think, you know what's really cool today? I am going to blow Doug's socks off. <laughs> I'm going to get him in the elevator alone, or, you know, George or whatever, and I'm going to do this and that. God loves to do that stuff. And he never gets tired of it. We think God gets tired. What he's tired of is our mediocrity, our lack of expectation, our lack of opening our lives to him. That's what he's tired of. So I just encourage you to, to try the discipline of preview. I give you guidelines for it um, to go through. So any question or comment on that, or have any of you tried it? I guess you were talking about it last week, did you say, Ollie? Did it, any of you try it? I'm curious. Yeah, I was trying to go through it, but I think a uh, recurring theme, at least for me today, is it, and we kind of talk about that discipline of keeping it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and how we kind of said early in the morning is a good time, but you know when you, you don't sleep well or something, and then that early morning time is pinched, and you don't have as much time in the morning. Uh, definitely, yeah, I feel like that discipline. But um, I kind of mentioned to you as well. I I know going on to prayer, having that time of preview, I think really helps my prayer yep. throughout the day, because once you're praying over certain things that are coming up. And as you mentioned in your story, you know, then as it's coming up or just before it, like you kind of having that constant talking with God about it. So, yeah, I do think that it, it's really helped me. It was this last week that I've really tried it, maybe five out of seven days. But yeah, mm -hmm. getting that. Yeah, good. Yeah, I think whatever it takes to bring creativity and freshness and a sense of expectation and faith to what we're doing. To me, it really builds that expectation. I mean, I was previewing all the way down here. I didn't know what kind of facility. I couldn't picture anything of what we were doing. But I'm just, and the Lord didn't really say anything to me except I'll be with you. And that was really obvious in the worship. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, uh, going a partner to that. No, sorry, there's the guidelines. But a partner to that is review. And many of you may have heard of the prayer of examine. Have any of you ever heard of the prayer of examine? E-X-A-M-E-N. It's unusual. You think of examination, but you spell it with an E. E-X-A-M-E-N. And this is where at the end of the day, um, and one of you already mentioned this somehow, but you kind of reflect at the end of the day, what went well, what didn't go so well. Oh, maybe it was the 10th step. Yeah, okay. Um, that reflection. But the prayer of examine really has two parts to it. One is consciousness, and the other is conscience. So consciousness is, Lord, where were you today? At where maybe I wasn't paying attention. Lord, when, when did you speak to me? Where, where are God's fingerprints? You know, you're kind of like a sleuth or a detective. You're looking over the day and saying, where did God show up for me today? And it may be in very small things you'll think about and, or in big ways you'll think about. Maybe God called, you know, maybe you got a special email from a friend and it was like, oh, they haven't forgotten about me, you know, or something like that. Or maybe, Lord, it seemed like it was a pretty ordinary day, but thank you for being with me. Jesus promises to be with us how often? Always. always. Lo, I am with you always. You know, to the close of the age. He is with us always. The key is, are we aware of it? Are we attentive to it? So, I encourage journaling. Again, you know, I just encourage journaling and just write down the highlights and the lowlights of the day. We used to do that with this with our kids. Remember, we had four kids in five and a half years, and we always had at least one meal time together a day. Now they were all in soccer, water polo, football. You know, you name it. Our kids were busy, but we would we would have one meal time together a day most days, almost every day. And I would often say, pits and peaks, let's just go around and check in with pits and peaks. You know, what was a pit, what was a low light, what was a peak? Sometimes they only had two pits and no peak, or two peaks and no pit, and that was fine. But just take an inventory of your life and just slow down long enough to reflect on it. Like, I'll go home today and I'll probably journal something this afternoon, I have that kind of latitude. 
and I'll just reflect on what I learned from our time together, what was encouraging, what I need to work on, or whatever, just reflecting on conversations. So, take some time, and it can just be bullet points. Again, you can be tired and stuff, and, but it's amazing if you can just bullet things down. And then um, reflect over the situations and ask for, that's, that's consciousness. Then conscience is, Lord, where did I let you down today? Or what were the missed opportunities? A conversation I had where I didn't share you like I could have. I, and why didn't I share? I was too busy. I was intimidated or afraid. Uh, I didn't know where to start. I don't feel so great myself. How can I talk about you to others? You know, just, just thinking about your conscience. And where did you, we, I don't know what kind of language you guys use. We talk about sins of omission as well as commissions. So what did I commit that was not good to do, that angry driving gesture, uh, maybe. And uh, the omission is what did I fail to do? You know, the old Episcopal prayer book, we have done those things we ought not to have done and we have left undone those things we should have done and there is no health in us. Uh, that's the discipline of review. So going back over our life, consciousness of the Lord and then paying attention to our own need for the Lord. This is where we're flying through the information. Are you still with me? Are we good? All right. A few minutes to go. Hang in there. Not your seatmate there and keep awake. All right. So prayer. I talked about three kinds of prayer. Yeah. When you're when you're writing a when you're writing a chapter on prayer, what is what do you think is the first thing that comes to mind? The Lord's prayer. Yeah. I meant as an author, what, what might you be thinking as an author? Exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah, be thankful. I was thinking more like, what do I have to say that hasn't already been said, right? I mean, it's, it's, there's so many great books on prayer. So again, as I was praying through this, the thing that I've encountered the least in being a spiritual director with people is listening prayer. Where people feel confident enough to listen to the Lord and know how to kind of weigh it and test it. Is this God? Is this myself? Is this heartburn? I mean, what am I, what am I experiencing right now, right? So when I thought about listening prayer, I thought, okay, let me take it back to the monologue. Uh, monologue prayer, which is how most of us pray. I think most of us pray. We do all the talking. Thanks, God. See you later. And we're gone. Right? I mean, that's how I pray. That's how I always started out. And when the disciples are taught to pray by Jesus, he teaches them a monologue. Like you said, the Lord's Prayer. And there's really no listening that Jesus apparently teaches us. Now, he does teach listening prayer. For example, John chapter 6. I only do what I see my Heavenly Father doing. Now, I agree, that's more like, how does he see that? But I, I'd say that's more listening prayer. And Jesus, I think, gives several other examples where it's very clear that I only, you know, I only speak what the Father gives me to speak. I thank you, Lord, that you have hidden these things. He kind of seems to know what God is doing. So the, the most common perception of prayer is that monologue prayer, where we just share what we need with the Lord. And my, I don't know if I say this in this book, but... My thing about prayer is don't describe, I mean, don't prescribe what God should do. Just describe your heart need. You know what? Describe your heart need. Do not prescribe what God should do. What do I mean by that? A lot of us say, Lord, it would be so good if you would just convert Shannon. She could be amazing for the kingdom if you would just change your heart, Lord. And help her to stop spending money. I'll stop. So, um, you know, but, but we think we need to tell God how to solve it. Leave the how to God. Lord, my heart is broken. Right? You just say, God, my heart is broken. I don't know what you're doing in this situation. I just pray for it. Like, we have a, an unmarried son, 43, who would love to be married. I do not understand this. And I, I stopped telling God, you know... Marianne would be really cool for Matthew. Um, you know, you just don't go there for a lot of reasons. 
And instead of telling God what to do, I leave the how with God, and I just say, Lord, you know my heartache. I just hold it out to you. And the Holy Spirit, in sighs and groans too deep for words, intercedes with us according to God. So that monologue is okay, and it is good. There is nothing wrong with it. My encouragement, though, is to grow into listening prayer. <clears throat> and listening prayer, I find easiest with a journal. And I will just begin by saying, Lord, if you could say anything to me right now, what would you say? And then I just sit and listen. And I may be writing. And a lot of us get nervous. Trust me, as a Presbyterian, I'm very nervous about charismatic things that can go off the rails. I'm very open to the Holy Spirit. But I know things can go off the rails. But I just listen as if the Lord were speaking to me. And very often, it's just like a very wise counsel. Usually words of affirmation. Doug, I love you. My call is on your life. And I, I want to use you or... I forgive you, or I give you a new start, or be grateful for what I've done. But it's that listening prayer and that sense of dialogue and going back and forth. And so I have some guidelines for listening prayer, and I'm actually going to read them to you here, and then we can have just a little back and forth. Uh, quiet yourself. Um, you know, focus on God, and maybe think of Him sitting across from you. Have you ever heard of the empty chair? dialogue with people. That's a wonderful thing to do when you're with them and say, well, Jesus, just pretend Jesus is sitting right here and just tell him what's on your heart. You know, that's wonderful. So write down distracting thoughts, just put them aside, and then say, Lord, if you could say anything to me now, what would you say? Be still and pay attention to any thoughts that arise. Write the thoughts that come. They may be scriptures, words, phrases, or sentences that come to mind. And you, you just write them. And hold them loosely. There's a time to go back and evaluate, but when you're listening, just hold it loosely. Like in a conversation with someone, you don't get ahead of them, right? You don't finish their sentences if you're a smart listener. You let them share their heart, you think, and then you reflect back. If you hear nothing, consider a number of factors. Perhaps your thoughts are still too active. Focus on the stillness and perhaps on your breathing. Perhaps you fear God may, uh, what God may say to you. Like he's going to call me to Africa. That used to be such a fear, right? Not anymore. Uh, focus on verses such as God is love. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Perhaps there's spiritual opposition. Pray it against distraction. If you hear nothing, relax and enjoy the stillness. God is present. Rest in God's grace, mercy, and peace. And then test and apply what you have heard. Does it evidence the fruit of the Spirit, bringing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, self-control? Does it honor the Lord? Does it encourage you? So I, I just, you know, I, would, I want to try a little experiment now with you, and this is where we'll end the day. Um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to listen to the Lord. So maybe you flip over your notes on the back so you just have a blank sheet of paper. And you know, you can't get this right or wrong. This is just an opportunity I want to give you. And just kind of write what comes and see how it feels. And then I'll, I'll give you about three minutes. I know Holy Spirit can use more time. But um, I'll give you about three minutes and then we'll just get your feedback. So let me pray for you as we go into this time. Oh Lord, our God, we believe you are the living Lord who is with us that you have communicated your unique revelation in the scripture, and yet we believe you still want to touch our hearts and encourage us. So I do pray now under the protection of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you would give us what you want to give us in this time. Lord, speak to your children. For like Samuel, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. We pray in Jesus' name. Now listen to the Lord. Write what comes and we'll talk about it.